Well, good morning, wherever you are in the world. It's a great pleasure to see so many of you here today to hear the talk by, by uh, Professor Marchant. We've known Trevor for a long time in the UK anthropological community. He is, I think, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the most creative anthropologists that we have in the country and globally even. His work is absolutely remarkable in the way that it crosses boundaries between material culture, anthropology, architecture, conceivably even archeology. span And in, inhabits this space in an extraordinarily interesting and engaging way by talking to practitioners, by being a practitioner himself, so that we really understand not just theoretically what it might mean uh, uh, when something is embodied, but we can actually see through the work of Trevor Marchant, the very illustration of a whole body of, of, of absolutely top-class anthropological theory at the same time as learning something new about the way the world works. What more could we possibly want from anthropology? So the title of Trevor's uh, talk today is The Pursuit of Pleasurable Work, which is the same title as his forthcoming book about which he will be uh, talking. Now, with regard to the questions, just as Helene said, please don't hesitate to fire in anything you'd like to ask to the Q&A box, because we will, I hope, have time for a very good discussion afterwards. Before, however, we turn to Trevor, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Hetzfeld, who is the series editor of the, uh, of the book series in which this book appears. And of course, at the same time, uh, a very well-known and wonderful anthropological colleague to the whole community. So, uh, Michael, if you're here, then please just, just, just go ahead. And after Michael said a few words, we'll pass over to Trevor. Thank you, David. Um, I had to turn on the uh, camera here, so that was the slight pause you saw there. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be back at the RAI, um, albeit virtually. I hope soon we'll be able to do this uh, in person again. Um, but of course, the extraordinary uh, international uh, spread that uh, has been demonstrated uh, just now, uh, all the countries that are represented, all the places within the UK as well, uh, all of this, I think, speaks to the importance, first of all, of the work of the RII, and specifically to the reputation, well-deserved reputation of Trevor Marchand. I can really only echo everything, David, that you just said uh, about uh, David's work. I've been asked to say a few words about the series. We are very delighted that among the very first books that we are publishing in this series, which is a revamped uh, series, it used to be with one of the American University Presses, uh, I think that our move to, uh, to Berkhan books was probably one of the most intelligent decisions I've ever made in my life. Um, Marianne Berkhan has been absolutely splendid and welcoming and Tom Bonington in the office has the fastest return on email I've ever encountered in my life. I think he sometimes gets there before I ask my questions. Um, I also want to thank my colleague, uh, Melissa Caldwell, uh, of the University of California at Santa Cruz, actually a former student of mine and my, uh, my uh, co-editor on the series, and Deborah Reed Danahe, who was uh, the co-editor of the earlier version of the series, um, and has been a wonderful source of advice and guidance. Um, in the new version of the series, it's acquired a subtitle, which I think says it all um, and make, explains also part of the reason for which uh, uh, Trevor's arrival in the series is such a, such a boost, uh, perspectives and provocations. Perspectives, how you situate yourself in relation to the material and conceptual world around you and to be provocative is to be a good anthropologist. I think we probably should all uh, agree about that. Um, one of the things that I have always said to my, my, my PhD students is that anthropology, uh, as of course Evans Pritchard told us a long time ago, is nothing if it's not comparative. Uh, like, so I always ask them, we don't have a Melanesianist in my department at the moment, why should a Melanesianist be interested in your work? Now, this was hard enough sometimes for Africanists or Middle East specialists to answer. Uh, Trevor Monchant is both of those things, as well as a Europeanist, as you'll see in a moment. Um, 
But it is particularly hard for Europeanists uh, because the discipline didn't welcome the anthropology of Europe in the early stages, uh, particularly warmly. In fact, there was quite a lot of opposition to it, um, sometimes from the same sources that were not very uh, kind to the RAI. Um, and uh, I think, David, you, you recognize the illusion. Um, and, and so uh, this, uh, this has created a situation in which it seems absolutely imperative to be able to say to the anthropological community, look, the anthropology of Europe may be a newcomer, uh, but there is an awful lot of work being done in Europe uh, that is theoretically and methodologically innovative, and that's why it deserves attention. And our series is designed precisely uh, to focus on that dimension. So we're not just interested in good ethnographies, we're interested in ethnographies that force people uh, to think. Uh, we've already got uh, two books, one out, one about to appear, uh, Violetta Schubert's Modernity and the Unmaking of Man, and soon to appear Daniel Knight's Vertiginous Life. Um, you can tell from the titles, these are not just ethnographies. Um, they have enormous comparative significance. And so it's very easy to ask either of them. So why should a Melanesianist be interested in what you have to say? I've never actually asked Trevor Marchand that question, but his own trajectory from the Yemen to uh, Jene uh, uh, in Africa, and much more recently to that utterly exotic terrain, the United Kingdom, and it looks very exotic to me now, an exile on the other side of the pond uh, since Brexit, um, he is doing anthropology uh, in the most embodied way possible. And he's also exemplifying, it seems to me, uh, what we really ought to mean by reflexivity. That is not a lot of breast beating about how wicked we all are, but thinking about ourselves as historical actors and what the work that we produce has to say about the significance of the discipline. So that really is pretty much all I want to say because I think it's already quite a lot. And um, I, I, I think that uh, Trevor certainly can speak for himself. I do again want to uh, thank the RAI and David in particular, and I want to thank Marian Burkhan for believing uh, in this project. And I think that the extraordinary titles that we've already attracted, we already have uh, four in play, in fact, two more in addition to the two that I mentioned and some others uh, have approached us. And the thing that also uh, is a bit surprising uh, for a new series is that most of those uh, who've approached us have been senior authors, which I think also shows how widely shared the confidence in the on books is. So uh, that's it from me. I'm enormously looking forward to hearing you, Trevor, even though I can't yet see you. Um, Trevor has been an inspiration to me in my own work on artisanship. He's far bolder than I am in venturing into this territory and carrying it uh, uh, now across three continents. So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Michael. That's, that, that, that's great. People can send in their proposals to you if they have a wonderful project for you. Ah, we'll hear about that later, I'm sure. So Trevor, please, please, please go ahead. Thank you, David. And thank you, Michael. Thank, thanks for your, both of you for your very generous introductions. Um, I'm, um, I feel incredibly honored um, to be introduced by both of you. Um, I want to thank the audience today for, um, for being here. I'm hoping that since many of you are from different places in the world, I'm hoping you're having better weather than we are today here in Gloucestershire. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that we're going to keep our electricity during the length of my, my talk. Um, I, um, but I really want to thank you for, for being here. And I know that um, I know that there are people here from anthropology and also from the craft world. Um, and people from a variety of different disciplines and practices. Um, and I'm really thrilled um, that such a diverse group has been able to come together. Um, it makes me quite excited. I want to thank the RAI and particularly David Shankland for inviting me to, um, to give this talk today. Um, 
before my book actually comes out um, as a published work, which it will do um, later this year. And I want to thank um, Hanin and Amanda and Emma for making this technologically possible. Um, thank you, Michael, again for your introductory words. And I think it's actually, it should be me who's saying that your work has been my inspiration. Um, your work has covered vast terrains and covered such exciting topics and it, um, it's been hugely inspirational. Before I begin, I must also thank the ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council, for their very generous support of the first field work that I did at the Building Crafts College, which I will be introducing to all of you to in just a few minutes. Um, they covered my work there um, between 2005 and 8. And I returned to the Building Crafts College in 2012 and 13 to conduct another study. And this was very generously supported by the British Academy. So thank you to the British Academy. I also thank SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, for, um, for supporting my interest to all my great colleagues there. Um, and um, yeah, for supporting me on my way through my explorations of craft work. I also must thank the Building Crafts College, my building field site, um, and the two directors that were there during my studies there. Um, very special thanks to the instructors who were always dedicated and very passionate about what they were doing, um, and to my fellow trainees, without whom I could not have done this research. I also thank the worshipful company of carpenters, the livery in London, and especially the archivist, Julie Tansel, who has been supportive throughout all of my research and archival work for the book. And finally, I just wanna thank Jen Law, who I'm going to be returning to at the end. Jen is going to be saying a few words to us after my talk. Um, she was the most important reader and commentator on the drafts of my book. Um, and she is also producing the cover art for it. And she's gonna be talking about the craft of producing that cover art um, when I finish speaking. So before starting, I just wanna say that my, the book itself covers a lot of ground. It covers, really, I, I delve into the history of apprenticeship and carpentry from medieval, Lundward, uh, from medieval London up to the early modern London period. Um, I delve into the history of vocational education in the UK right up to the thorny politics in the present day. Um, I also cover the, uh, the history of the Building Crafts College, which is a most fascinating place. It was um, established in 1893 and it served as my field site. Um, I also cover really the, very much the heart of the book is the ethnography of teaching and training at the college um, and with my fellow woodworkers. The book is also very much an ode to the politics of crafts work. Um, and in doing so, I explore our human relationship with the tools that we use in hand. So the brain hand tool um, relationship is very central to the book, as is the subject of problem solving, which I will raise in today's talk. Problem solving at the bench between fellow woodworkers, between mentors and mentees. Um, also importantly, I cover in the book, or I tried to cover, our changing relationship to our tools that we use and to the skills that we have as our bodies and our minds age. Um, and I, 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 I feel that that's something very important for us to, to contemplate and um, hopefully more research will be done in that field. Um, and I also deal at the end of the book with the future of craft work not just in the UK, but worldwide. What is the future of craft work in a fast moving world where there's more and more mass production, more and more consumers, and what is the role of craft work? And I ultimately call for a radical reform in our educational curricula across the board. Um, and so it's that politics of crafts work and the need for educational reform that I'm gonna to choose to focus on today in my, uh, in my talk. So let me just share my screen with you. Great. Um, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I expect you can. So in brief, the 
forthcoming book is really a retort to the dehumanizing trend of de-skilling and a call for radical reform to the educational curriculum, namely by placing hands-on making at its heart. As both an academic and craftsperson, my goal is not merely to promote global appreciation for the learning, skill, and knowledge that defines crafts work, but also to ignite a positive revaluation of creative handwork as a vehicle for individual fulfillment, intellectually, physically, and spiritually. The narrow definition of worthy work with which we evaluate and operate neglects the rich diversity of intelligences that exist in both children and adults and leave latent aptitudes unattended and unformed. The exaltation of book smarts has blinded our society to the kinds of complex skilled intelligence involved in craft work. This blinkered system with sights set on academic achievement has tragically diminished the range of desirable career options, it's constricted popular imaginings of what is success and undermined entire sectors of the nation's economy. These factors have contributed enormously to the skills gap that has plagued Britain for the past half century and relatedly to a widening socioeconomic disparity in the population. I'm going to return to these issues later in today's short presentation. During my first 13 years as an anthropologist, I carried out field work with teams of masons on building sites in West Africa and Arabia, studying their apprenticeship systems and the ways that skilled trade knowledge was learned and practiced in historic urban contexts. All of the masons I labored for were practiced in the vernacular style of architecture that characterized their town or city. They employed either mud or kiln-baked brick and local building technologies to create distinctive building forms and decorative elements. Apprenticing as a technique of anthropological inquiry is, I believe, well suited to the study of learning and knowing in practice-based contexts where talking is upstaged by doing. It also equips anthropologists with firsthand experience and possibly some level of expertise in the practices that they theorize and write about. At a personal level, while apprenticing and training craft work, in craft work, I could pursue the pleasure that I experience in collectively making things with other people while indulging my curiosity about the way that we as humans think, calculate, communicate, and create. Learning to sustain focused attention and inquisitiveness as an anthropologist while laboring and apprenticing on busy building sites prepared me for the even more intense immersion I would experience as a trainee within a community of fine woodworkers in England. In 2005, I signed on for the two-year full-time course in fine woodworking at the Building Crafts College located in Stratford in London's East End. Since its founding in 1893, the college has been governed by the Worshipful Company of Carpenters, one of the oldest liveries or guilds in the city of London, and one of the few to keep an active hand in craft training, the awarding of qualifications, and the regulation of standards and practices. The livery's objective in opening the trade school was to safeguard traditional building crafts against sweeping changes in the 19th century wrought by industrialization and mass production. The college remit has changed over time, but when I began field work there as a trainee, it retained a strong sense of its founding spirit, committed to fostering craft excellence and perpetuating building craft traditions in wood, stone masonry, and at the time, lead work. The college spirit was powerfully conveyed by woodwork convener, Cheryl Matti. I quote, when you're in London, you stop and look and you think, my God, this place is important. It's gorgeous and there's lovely buildings. It's a fantastic place. And it got that way because of people like the ones coming out of here. We're the building crafts college. We're probably the last place that can say, we uphold a century plus tradition of pure skills. 
And if it's not us, it's not going to be anybody. Cheryl's colleague, Jim O'Brien, convener of the bench joinery and shop fitting course had this to add. We're teaching them personal formation. If you want to use a terminology, we're using a holistic approach here. We don't just feed one sense. We're going across the whole person. When you get them in the first year, they're a pimply 16, four foot nothing Lilliputian. And when the three years are up, they're six foot two and wide as you like. And they've not just grown in body, they've grown spiritually and mentally as well. I'm not talking about religious spiritual. The craft is spiritual, if you like. Our pride is a spiritual thing. It's a question of, I've done it. I don't care who knows. I know. I know I've done it. That's the spiritual bit. Term time commenced in mid-September and ended in early July, and the weekly schedule emulated the average full-time working week in the building trades with a lunch break and short tea breaks in the morning and afternoon. Over the rigorous two-year period, my fellow trainees and me gave shape and, direct and direction to our ambition for becoming craftspeople, and we discovered personal potential and limitations. Each of us came to realize that patience was the essential ingredient to success in fine woodworking. Frustrations over making mistakes were gradually reframed as opportunities for practice, which in turn built confidence in our abilities to repair and make good. Crucially, we learned the challenge of teamwork and the benefits of sharing best practice. Fine woodwork instructor David Wheeler expounded further on the reciprocal relation between creative making and fostering a sense of self-control and agency. Through immersion in making and creating, he suggested, students were learning not only to physically control their technical manipulation of tools and the transformation of raw materials into functional and aesthetic objects, they were also learning to temper their impatience re-educate their desires and expectations for immediate results, and harness their emotions when confronted with a challenge or upon discovering a mistake. Going one step further, posing problems and setting new challenges for oneself is deemed critical to a maker's growth and development and to re-experiencing the triumphal pleasure that accompanies overcoming. In problem-posing forms of learning, educator and philosopher Paolo Frade remarked that people come to see the world not as static reality, but as a reality in process, in transformation. When I arrived in 2005, there were roughly 210 students enrolled across all courses. The vast majority, more than 80%, were modern apprentices who came to the college for short periods on block release from their places of work to earn national vocational qualifications or NVQs. By contrast, trainees on the far smaller fine woodwork and banker masonry programs were at the college full time and without direct connections to employers or to invaluable workplace experience. Despite strong college ambitions for gender diversity in its programs, my cohort was made up of nine trainees all of whom were male. Four of the men in my cohort were teenagers and recent finishers of secondary education with GCSE qualifications. The remaining trainees were mature students, ranging in age from early 20s to late 30s. All the mature trainees had abandoned other lines of employment and the security of steady wages in their quest for a new and what they hoped would be a more satisfying way of living and working. In my writing, I coined them collectively as vocational migrants and not as career changers, which is the more conventional term. I use vocational migrants because each one had made a deliberate decision to pursue carpentry as a practice to which they would dedicate their whole person, heart, mind, and body. The life experiences these people brought to their learning and the thoughtful aspirations they had for the future made their contributions to my study especially rich. Out of a total of 38 trainees making up the 
four cohorts that participated in my two different periods of research, nearly two thirds were vocational migrants. As a demographic group, the vocational migrants comprised a mix of mainly white British men, two black British men and four white British women. The majority could be described socioeconomically as having middle-class backgrounds. They had completed secondary education and many held university degrees, after which they worked in a variety of fields, including business, banking, real estate, consultancy, healthcare, transport, the media, and the fine arts. In coming to carpentry, they had either quit steady and in some cases well remunerated jobs or professional careers, or had deviated from the usual trajectories dictated by higher education qualifications that they held. For the majority, it was hoped that craft work would be a way of living, not merely a means to make a living. Fellow trainee Robert, stationed at the neighboring workbench, captured that prevailing sentiment with panache. I had a complete lack of satisfaction with corporate computer-based life. There were always bigger processes happening at higher levels over which I had little control. I had lots of responsibility, but little authority. I was always busy, always stressed. After receiving an MPhil in social sciences, Robert took a job at a London-based environmental consultancy. I joined, believing that I would be part of something that could make things better. But I discovered that in reality, we were only making things less worse. Stress-related illness forced him to resign at 31 and embark on a new path to living and working. Becoming a carpenter promised scope for being autonomous and the freedom to seek a professional identity that need not conform to the dominant Western model of success. Working with wood and hand tools is like a retreat, almost in a religious sense, Robert explained. I feel that I can cut myself off from the negative manifestations of modernity, the noise, the constant material consumption, and return to being someone capable of completing something from a thought to a finished product. He articulated how woodworking gave him a sense of integrity and transformed work into a satisfying way of living day to day. I can turn up in any place and just be a carpenter, a woodworker. It's a skill that I think there'll always be demand for. And to have it seems good and honest. The longing for self-sufficiency over creative processes and livelihood was not a quest for isolation from the world, but to be part of a new order. Craftspeople who consciously or unconsciously draw inspiration from, this, from the spirit of the 19th century arts and crafts, the craft revival of the 1960s and 70s, or other politically spirited craft movements, recognize the need to breathe new life into those imagined pasts by rearticulating the values and guiding principles within their own visions for tomorrow. Craft work for them holds the kernel of a promise to unite mind, body, and spirit in pleasurable activity, unleash creative potential, and empower the maker within a circular economy. A circular economy that joins makers and clients in their shared desire for durable, handcrafted objects that are produced from sustainably sourced materials and which, at the end of their serviceable life, can be recycled or will return to the earth from which they came. In addition to the interviews I recorded with college trainees and instructors, I also interviewed recent graduates, established English furniture makers like James Werner in the picture, and a variety of other individuals involved in some way or another with the industry. All illuminated my thinking about contemporary trends, green agendas, politics, and economies in the trade. Their stories and voices take center stage in the pages of my book. Their daily dialogue and the responses they offered to my questions squarely challenge widely held misconceptions that craftspeople are good with their hands but struggle to verbalize what they know. These men and women vividly recount their journeys into craft work and thoughtfully articulate opinions, positions, hopes, and concerns at times with poetic insight and profound wisdom. Their ideas and reflections contributed directly to the theory and analysis I offer in the book chapters. 
Ongoing developments in my explorations of embodied ways of thinking and knowing returned me to the Building Crafts, not, to the Building Crafts College in 2012 and 13. That field-based project investigated the entwined relationship between our brains, our hands, and the tools that we use. With the assistance of a professional cameraman, I made numerous recordings that allowed me to scrutinize solo and collaborative problem-solving sessions at the workbench. Creative problem solving, it should be added, is integral to every stage of carpentry production, from design and making, to marketing and pricing, to delivery and installation. Solving a problem draws heavily on past learning and practical experiences that are directly or tangentially related to the challenge at hand. At the same time, it relies on the ability to imagine options, forecast outcomes, weigh choices, and strategize a possible way forward. To do so in a manner that appears effortless is the defining trait of mastery. The ability to solve problems and overcome challenges in the flow of work is also empowering. Crafting solutions builds confidence, motivates the desire to reach further, and heightens the sense of agency that makers have over their production and the contribution they make to society. Put simply, it's a vehicle to self-discovery, fulfillment, and pleasurable work. The month before my cohort arrived at the college to begin training, Hurricane Katrina made landfall in Florida and Louisiana with devastating impact. The Kyoto Protocol had come into force earlier that year, and grassroots environmental awareness and activism gained momentum in 2006 with the release of Al Gore's documentary film, An Inconvenient Truth. The environmental movement with its early beginnings in the 19th century was becoming ever more urgent and a prominent force in the minds of woodworkers who planned to pursue sustainable place-centered practices. My fellow trainees described the items they created as being built to last, or heirloom pieces, in explicit contrast to the mass-produced flat pack assemble it yourself furniture sold on the high street, which one colleague proposed is ultimately destined for landfill. Trainee Emily insisted that, and I quote at length, the relevance of the craftsmanship we're learning here at the college is largely political. Lots of designers in the 1950s and 60s were instructed to make things that would wear out and break in order to fuel consumption. From the vantage point of human nature, going down the route of mass consumption is like self-harm. It's where the disillusion in society comes from. We've been led into a cynical way of living that is destroying society by not allowing people to be resourceful or to understand how things are made. It's giving people crap, churning out more and more rubbish. The consequences are fairly devastating, both socially and environmentally. On that basis alone, it's a shame we can't train everybody to make things that they need. Indeed, self-reliance and handwork can be harnessed for political ends and as a means to social reform. In particular, Craftwork has been an engine of grassroots countercultural movements since at least the 19th century. To the present day, craft, as a fully embodied practice in dialogue with materials, retains its capacity as a social movement of resistance and opposition to a range of issues. These issues include crass capitalism, mainstream throwaway consumerism, the threats posed by artificial intelligence and robotization to human agency, creativity, and employment, to the homogenization of our high streets and the degradation of our city centers, and to the sense of disembodiment precipitated by phones, apps, social media, the internet, and gaming. When I began this study, Kraft was undergoing a renaissance. At the turn of the millennium, there was growing evidence that the value and potential benefits of things handmade were on the radar of both producers and consumers in Britain and elsewhere in the post-industrial world. 
In 2005, there were an estimated 32,000 self-identified craftspeople or in contemporary language designer makers living and working in England and Wales alone. Colin Eden Eden, a convener of the Fine Woodwork Program observed that it's like the modern equivalent of maybe not the arts and crafts movement, not, a big, not as big a sea change as that with William Morris, but I think it's people becoming dissatisfied with the soullessness of working in big corporate organizations, everybody being slotted into little pockets of existence and the routine of it all. That's a key reason why we've seen lots of mature career changers coming into our program. Perhaps rather than conceiving of today's revolt as a unique and bounded episode of our time, it might be beneficially understood as the current phase in a timeless grassroots quest for a utopian society that is more humane, more just, peaceful, deferential to beauty, ecologically respectful, and above all, ethically purposeful. Alongside trainees hopes, however, was an unwanted awareness that the English market for one of a kind pieces of furniture was minuscule and that the risks and costs involved in striving to become the artist craftsperson were high. Historically, only a small number of English furniture makers ever became household names, most notably the 18th century masters, Thomas Chippendale, Thomas Sheraton, and George Heppelwhite. With the possible exception of John Makepeace, the, the same holds true for today's avant-garde makers, and that's despite the vibrancy of the contemporary bespoke furniture industry. As woodwork instructor Cheryl shrewdly remarked, everybody in the country knows who Andy Murray is, but name a furniture maker, most people couldn't. Most people don't know anything about any of the trades really, apart from the name of someone who came around the house to fix something. Broadly speaking, Furniture making isn't regarded as any higher than that. At the midpoint in our training program, fellow woodworker Robert conducted a recorded interview with me. He concluded by commenting on how quickly time had passed at the Building Crafts College. Holy Toledo, it's been fast, I concurred. That gives me a bit of anxiety because I'm that much closer to having to decide what's next. Am I gonna take this train beyond the research program? meaning would I abandon my academic position to become a craftsman? Robert responded, frankly, I don't think you will. You need to combine your academic pursuits and your carpentry in some realistic way. Robert was correct, of course. I did not leave the university, at least not immediately, and I did not become a furniture maker. Five years after graduating from the college, I returned there to conduct a second research project on brain, hand, and tool, which I mentioned earlier. I published articles, made a short documentary film with Pete Dugarian, who I saw is in the audience today, and delivered dozens of academic lectures and public talks based on the two studies with fine woodworkers. It nevertheless took more than a decade to complete this book. A string of momentous life events, new research projects, competing deadlines, and other book publications were all factors in the delay. There was, however, another perhaps more significant reason. I had become too close to my subject of study, and I had embraced the contemporary politics of craft work as my own. I shared with the majority of vocational migrants a desire to reduce the scale of our worlds to one more immediately manageable, to transform the impotence we experienced in face of global forces and events into a confident capacity to bring about change through the things of beauty and worth that we would produce and the ways that we would produce them. Like them, I believe too that the mode of production that characterized studio craft held promise of living authentically and earning an honest wage. Taking up and taking part in shaping worldviews in the workshop afforded penetrating insight into value, social politics, and aspirations. But in doing so, I also risked ignoring inconvenient truths and omitting unpalatable realities from my anthropological thinking and writing. 
It was therefore necessary to create distance, politically and emotionally. Only by disengaging was I able to take stock of the structural issues, inconvenient contradictions, and real challenges that lurked and operated within the wider, messier context of contemporary craft work. A month after my cohort graduated with high hopes, the subprime mortgage crisis erupted in the United States. By the following year, it had become a full-blown global financial catastrophe, precipitating what had been dubbed the Great Recession and a seemingly incessant program of fiscal austerity here in Britain. Of the two dozen fine woodworkers who had trained at the Building Crafts College between 2005 and seven while I was enrolled there as a trainee, only a tiny minority managed to immediately establish themselves as sole traders making bespoke furniture. Individual artisanal skill played its part, but the accomplishment rested more heavily on the independent financial means of those particular graduates to take the plunge and whether the long and risky startup period requisite for building business networks and a clientele. The majority of others persisted in the wood trades in one form or another for at least a few years after graduating. They hired bench space in existing workshops or found employment with firms specialized in batch production, fitting kitchens, or doing architectural joinery and site carpentry. Some occasionally landed private commissions to create the kind of furniture they had designed and made at college. Over the following years, several graduates left carpentry behind altogether and moved on to other pursuits, while a tenacious few progressively established themselves as sole traders, producing a mix of fine woodwork, cabinetry, and furniture. Students in creative arts, crafts, and vocational programs throughout Britain, and not merely those at the Building Crafts College, graduate and move into the world of work with inadequate and often no business training for making a living at what they do. For many, that lacuna in their education represents the highest hurdle to achievement. In spite of the fact that it's makers who identify the need for business training, enrollment figures on short courses in business offered by institutions like the Crafts Council tend to remain meager. The steady fact is that most craftspeople channel their emotional, physical, and intellectual energies into design and making and into the constant creative problem solving that those combined tasks entail. Business planning, accounting, client networking, promotional campaigning, and social media marketing, though recognized as necessary, are perceived by most, by most as a distinct enterprise that steals valuable time, resources, and focus away from what they do best. A number of other salient factors hampered dreams of becoming a soil trader. For example, for graduating woodworkers, especially those living and wishing to remain in London, finding affordable workshop space posed a major impediment. So too did the sluggish UK market for bespoke handmade furniture, further exacerbated by a general lack among makers of necessary marketing savvy. Instructor Colin, astutely noticed that when it comes to design, there's a tendency in this country for buyers to be conservative with a small C. There has been some shift in consumer tastes, however, as bluntly acknowledged by established furniture maker, Johnny Hawks. He said to me, Ikea is a company from God. It got the public out of a rut and into modern furniture. Now the first time buyer skips the antique reproduction shit and shops at Ikea. They get used to living with modern furniture. And then when they accumulate money, they can commission and buy better quality bespoke pieces. pieces. Ikea is my marketing. We craftspeople are no good at marketing. We haven't a fucking clue. To conclude this talk, I return now to the pressing question of a hands-on education. Vocational colleges that were on the front lines in the nation's battle to shrink its long-standing skills gap were in fact squeezed by a lack of financing from government funding bodies throughout the post-recession period. 
facilities at further educational co colleges across Britain that offered wood machining, shop fitting, and joinery tuition were reported to be deteriorating as a result. While the departments of business and culture heralded the impressive growth of the creative industry sector during Britain's economic recovery, the Department of Education narrowed the school curriculum, keen to emphasize traditional academic subjects over the arts, including crafts. As a consequence, schools that had just managed to preserve their precious woodworking, metalworking, and other technology departments throughout the decades of cuts finally witnessed their closure. Schools also experienced drastic declines in the enrollment of pupils on creative courses. These major setbacks were compounded by the fact that school appraisals in the UK have been narrowly based on proportions of students attaining A levels and gaining admission to university. Incentives and rewards for preparing school leavers to follow routes into vocational and craft training or apprenticeships are by contrast negligible. Instructor Cheryl commented, I actually don't know if we as a society haven't said, this isn't a trade that people here in the UK are interested in, let's just let it go. It's almost like the government have decided, we're not gonna make this an attractive option for people in this country, it's a global market, so we don't really need to make an effort. Parents too don't really want their kids going into construction work because of the lack of value placed on working with your hands. In its education manifesto for craft and making, the Crafts Council set out a clear vision calling on government, business and educators to ensure that, I quote, every child has a chance to discover their practical abilities, develop their creative talents and become a maker of the future. This vision is rooted in the knowledge that craft skills lead to diverse careers and creative satisfaction throughout life, end of quote. It's not merely government, business, and educators, however, who need to be brought on board this agenda for sweeping educational reform. The country needs a sea change in thinking among parents and guardians too. As Cheryl noted, many judge the vocational route as inferior to the academic one and far less prestigious. Craft and other kinds of creative skilled handwork are perceived as poor and unfulfilling career options for their children. In short, manual trades, including the arts and crafts, are denigrated as a refuge for the academically less capable. In the words of woodwork instructor Kate Payne, if you got a group of young kids to draw pictures of what brainy people look like, they probably wouldn't be of women or of anybody who works with their hands. They would be of men in suits. But the wood occupations implicitly involve quite difficult geometry, maths, and spatial awareness. The demise of hand skills and craft work in the UK is explained in large part as a consequence of rapid industrialization and exponential population growth in the 19th century, hastened in the 20th by technological advancement, globalization, and Britain's shift to a service economy. The resulting low status of manual, of manual trades persists in the post-industrial era. While it would be unrealistic to suppose that the march of technology can be stemmed or the impacts of globalized mass production reversed to restore some idealized world of craftsmanship, it is nevertheless entirely possible to alter the ways that we, as a society, appreciate and value handwork. In popular discourse on intelligence, the mind prevails while the body continues to be underestimated, undervalued, or misrepresented as being subservient to mind. Today, however, anthropology, cognitive studies, the neurosciences, philosophy of mind, craft studies, and educational studies are providing fresh insights into the nature of skill learning, tool use, and the interconnectedness of language, conceptual thought, sensory apparatus, and motor cognition. Careful cross-disciplinary studies of how the body learns and knows are essential to undermining entrenched stereotypes and cultivating fuller appreciation of skilled practice. 
promising contemporary research is supplying the basis for more encompassing and empirically based understandings of knowledge and intelligence. Discoveries and new theories are indeed disseminated in academic outputs. But if general attitudes towards handwork are to be enlightened, then research findings also need to be channeled through parliament and the media and embraced by the education sector and translated into new pedagogies. As my book chapters reveal, absorption in creative handwork broadens cognitive development, it unifies body, mind, and spirit by strengthening coordination between brain, hand, and perceptual senses, it sharpens problem-solving skills, it hones patience, concentration, focused awareness, and dedication to tasks. It nurtures a sense of ownership and responsibility, and it engages us mindfully with the natural world that gives us life and the material world that gives it meaning. Creatively solving problems, making things, and sharing them with others are not only pleasurable, they are culturally, socially, and economically productive. They are also at the very core of what makes us human and what endows us with humanity. For these reasons, education of the hand should be valued on a par with that of the mind. In fact, the indissoluble link between the two must be formally recognized as the basis for revolutionary educational reform. In 1880, when William Morris was railing against the predominant utilitarian ethos of public education and the commercial opportunism that had infiltrated the university, the school leaving age in England was just 10 years old. By the mid 20th century, it was 15 years old and increased to 16 by 1972. At present, young men and women may choose to leave school at 16, but recent legislation requires that they either stay in full-time or part-time education or enroll on an apprenticeship or preparatory traineeship until the minimum age of 18. Surely the increased length of statutory schooling and training offers a unique occasion for radically rethinking the basic curriculum for all students from primary school through secondary and post-secondary education. A new and progressive curriculum must address physical and emotional intelligences, as well as conceptual thinking in order to nurture the whole person. In doing so, schooling can become the democratic enabler it should be, supplying supportive mentoring and a diversity of instruction that fosters skills for independent critical thinking and that empowers each individual to choose, pursue, and realize their full potential. Morris rejected the division made between academic learning and practical training, believing that education should cultivate the powers of the mind as well as those of the eye and the hand. He energetically advocated for a liberal education that would provide students with opportunity to, I quote, have their share of whatever knowledge there is in the world according to their capacity or bent of mind, historical or scientific and also to have their share of skill of hand, which is about in the world, either in the industrial handicrafts or in the fine arts. A true education, Morris believed, should stoke the quest for knowledge and the creation of beauty for their own sake. Scholar and trustee of the William Morris Society, Philippa Bennett, proposed that Morris's vision for a rounded education still holds promise to transform our relationship to whatever work we do by helping us to discover interest in it and perhaps even beauty. This would lead not only to individual self-actualization, but likewise to a more diverse and resilient economy and a happier, more inclusive and egalitarian society. There should exist no obligation for boys and girls or for women and men to choose between a future of mind work or hand work. Viable options to engage in both and in unison need to be made available. This of course can only arise if learning frameworks at school and in the workplace are engineered to scaffold lifelong pursuits of physical, intellectual and spiritual development. 
In the spirit of both, of both Morris and American philosopher and educational reformer John Dewey, contemporary educationalist Mike Rose argued that, I quote, to acknowledge our collective capacity is to take the concept of variability seriously, not as slots along a simplified cognitive continuum or as a neat high-low distribution, but as a bountiful and layered field where many processes and domains of knowledge interact. I agree full-heartedly with Rose. Creating a more level playing field that prioritizes a plur pl plurality of intelligences must begin at school and in the home. Diffusing the dichotomy and dismantling the hierarchy between mind and body need not diminish the importance of book smarts. Rather, a level playing field hinges on raising the profile of skill-based learning and suturing the plurality of intelligences into a pioneering curriculum of learning activities. Craftwork proffers the ideal curricular activity for synthesizing diverse ways of knowing and for elegantly bridging learning with our immediate material surroundings and the wider world of which we are a part. It is a pathway to intellectual and physical discovery that elicits skillful improvisation and on occasion, innovation. At the nucleus of practical hands-on making, as I've said many times in this talk, is problem solving, which drives imaginations and fosters abilities to predict, plan, weigh options, and carefully strategize solutions. Creatively working things out with materials and tools and often in collaboration with others, including with other species. In places learners and seasoned practitioners alike in the immediacy of the present while simultaneously engaging them with rich histories of practices and prompting them to anticipate and shape possible futures. In short, craft work prepares people for social citizenship and endows them with the skills for making the world a better place for all. Thank you. I'm going to now thank you for um, your patience and, and for listening to that. Um, I can't see you and I can't hear any of you yet, but um, I'm going to, um, I have the great pleasure of introducing Jen Law, who's going to, um, to say uh, a few words um, on the process of creating the artwork for the cover of my book. And um, I just need to mention here, Great thanks to Marianne Burkhan and Burkhan, to, to Tom um, and to Ben at Burkhan for, um, for making the, uh, the publishing project a very exciting one and a really nice one. So just back to Jen. Um, Jen has a fine arts degree from Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. And she went on to study anthropology at McGill, which is where we met. She and I continued on to a PhD um, in anthropology at SOAS. And Jen's research took her to South Africa to work with contemporary artists. She returned to Canada eventually, and she lives now in Toronto, and she returned to printmaking. And she's exhibited widely in North America. She is the co-founder of Art and Letters Press, which publishes the beautiful annual journal, Art and Reading, for which Jen is an editor. She was also a contributor to Craftwork as Problem Solving, a book that, an edited book that I produced a few years ago. And she explores her process in that book beautifully. And as I said, she has produced the, um, the cover for the artwork. And I believe Jen will be online now. Is that, Correct, Hanin. Hi. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you, Jen. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Trevor, uh, for a wonderful talk about your research and also for inviting me to speak a little bit um, about the cover design. I don't know if you have the slide of the um, full cover there. Um, it's a sincere honor to be part of this conversation. 
I've been thinking a lot about how to approach this. It's a little unusual for a lecture about a book to include a discussion about the cover. But in inviting me, I believe that Trevor's intention um, is to offer a glimpse at the making of a book as an object uh, from the inside and out, as well as to extend uh, the conversation into other areas of making. A cover is often our first introduction to a book, a hint to what lies within. Hence the uh, adage about judging a book by its cover. So I should probably emphasize at this point that any shortcomings with the design are mine alone, but I do hope that the design does justice to Trevor's incredible text. I do not design book covers professionally, but I am a professional artist as well as an anthropologist. And my practice is deeply rooted in print and book culture. And so the image that you see on the screen is a work in process. The title plate, for example, is just a placeholder at the moment um, to give you an idea of how the image might look as a cover. And I haven't had a chance to fully resolve the design yet. And there are further stages that it must go through to prepare it and clean it up before it goes to press. So generally my instinct is to hold my work close to my chest until it's fully resolved. And I'm not going to lie, it feels vulnerable at this stage in the design and full of anxiety and second guesses, all the more so when a design um, seeks to engage and reflect someone else's work. Um, but I also appreciate as a researcher um, that the most interesting part of research on material practice is to be found in seeing and understanding the process of making itself. It lies in the problem solving uh, and in understanding the collaborative nature of creativity. So in this regard, and as a visual introduction to the book, I think it's important to note that the cover design reflects a conversation between Trevor and William Morris, between Trevor and his fellow woodworking trainees, um, but also in a much smaller way between Trevor and myself in relation to his research. So one of the perks of being friends with an author is that sometimes I might invite you to design a cover for their latest book. And if you're really lucky, like I was, you also get to be an early reader of their manuscript. And reading this text was truly the highlight of my summer last year. And importantly, most of that reading took part or place in my garden. And I think that gardens have become especially meaningful spaces globally uh, during this pandemic when so many people are seeking to connect with nature um, and to find solace in their gardens. So based on the designs of Morris, the cover design focuses around the concept of the garden as a place to find inspiration, to plant seeds. It's a place for things to grow and to take root. And significantly, Morris viewed the garden as an integral part of the home. This is reflected in all of his designs. He literally brings the garden into the domestic sphere, but he likewise approaches the outside garden as an extension of the house, as another room. Um, this immersive methodology of making, if you will, is how he approached everything that he did in his entire practice, whether he was designing wallpaper or textiles or furniture or writing poetry or printing books. It's all about crafting a pleasurable space to inhabit. I think that this holistic approach is also the way that Trevor conducts his research and has done so consistently since he was a graduate student working in Yemen, expanding his work as an architect through anthropology as a set of methodologies for understanding how communities build, how they make, how they think, and how they live. Um, I think Trevor approaches learning and writing about craft um, literally as a maker from the inside out through training and practice. Morris likewise emphasized the idea that design and making of an item should not be separate from one another. 
that the creation of objects um, should be by designer artisans. And he mastered multiple crafts himself and insisted on learning the techniques of production before he produced a design. And among his many skills were uh, book design and printmaking. He founded Kelmscott um, Press in 1891, which inspired the fine art um, press movement in the UK and through North America well into the 20th century and beyond. And it fueled a desire for um, the, the crafting of beautiful books that were both aesthetic and intellectual objects. As a printmaker, I am drawn to Morris's graphic sensibility, his ability to create bold designs from natural forms. And I've tried to marry Morris's garden imagery um, with more cultural forms, in this case, chairs, which were a central project in the fine woodworking course that Trevor writes about in his book. So I'm just gonna show you um, some process slides of um, my thinking process as I went um, through the making of this design. So Trevor, if you wanna the, show the next slide. Um, the, the first stage was for me to make these small paper cut um, chairs. I, I remember um, quite fondly the, the chair in Trevor's home that he made during his, this, um, his training uh, at the Crafts College. Um, so that was my starting point. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and I started placing them in um, some of Morris's designs to see how they might integrate with his garden imagery. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. But I wasn't so, um, I didn't want the chairs or the cultural forms to sort of just sit on top of the organic forms. I did play with other images, including, I don't know if, if it's clear here, but with tools integrated into the design. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, oh, back one. Uh, but I dismissed that fairly early on. I, 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 I was still stuck in the mindset of the chairs, but I did make the tools a nice little Morris inspired envelope toolbox to keep them in um, and place them to the side. Um, but as I mentioned, I wanted to integrate, if we go to the final slide, I just wanted to, to find a way of integrating the chairs more um, to be part of the garden, uh, wrapping the design around them, but keeping their graphic uh, quality as silhouettes as well. I think um, the way I was thinking in this context was that any creative space is a garden of sorts, whether it's a library, whether it's an artist studio or whether it's a carpentry workshop. So the next stage for me would normally be to print this design as a screen print or as a photolithograph. But unfortunately the print studio uh, where I print in Toronto is closed currently during um, due to current uh, COVID protocols. So instead, um, with the help of my long-term print collaborator, Pudi Tong, we'll take the design through a digital stage to clean up the inconsistencies um, in um, Adobe Illustrator, uh, but retain some of the hand variation that you get from an ink drawing. And I'm sure there are many artists who would have designed the entire um, cover from start to finish in an Illustrator. Uh, but I work in a much more analog way and um, I often have to figure out what I'm doing um, with a work of art um, in a material way first. So I'm not going to take up any more time. I'm sure that there are many questions for Trevor about the contents of his book. Um, but I want to thank Trevor and the RIA for allowing me to share my design and process in this forum. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Well, thank you very much indeed for that wonderful overview. It's a beautiful design. It does remind me of William Morris. So, so, so thank, thank you. Thank you. And it also looks like a 17th century Barker Bible title page. I don't know whether that was in your in your mind, but um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll have to have to have to have to see. Well, Trevor, that was absolutely marvelous. We've got lots of questions, but I'd just like to ask for a little clarification, please, before we go we go we go through. You, you, you referenced your earlier work going by uh, as you started. 
what influence did that early work have for your later rediscovery, as it were, of, Brit of British, British craft? And um, do you think, are there differences in the cultures? Did you take something from the first one and so on? Thanks, David, for that question. I think that's a really important starting point. And I do actually address it quite squarely in the book, but um, it might be interesting for the audience to know that um, I had been working, in fact, I, I, the, first, the first sites that I was um, studying were in Northern Nigeria. Um, and that was before I did my PhD. I was working with master uh, mud brick masons there. And then I went over to Yemen and I worked as a minaret builder for a year. And then I went to Jene and worked as a mud mason for several building seasons. And all of this was to try to compare and contrast how apprenticeship played itself out in different contexts and what role culture and society played in kind of the, the shaping of learning and training. Um, but I felt it was time to, to look at, to look more carefully at culture closer to home and to look at the kind of vocational training that was going on here in the UK, which has its roots in apprenticeship all the way back to the medieval period and all the way through the transformations in the 18th and 19th century and in through the 20th century, but it has its roots there. Um, and um, I mean, even today, the government calls its program the modern apprenticeship or just the apprenticeship scheme. So there's still that, that link. And I wanted to look at, wanted to look at the, um, the apprenticeship system here and craft training here to compare and contrast with the, uh, with the other field studies and to understand also the roles that particularly literacy and numeracy play in the learning program. The men that I worked with in Yemen and in um, West Africa were for the most part illiterate and enumerate. Um, that didn't mean they didn't mathematize, they did so in, in very expert ways with their bodies. But they, they didn't write things out and draw things and work things out on paper. So I wanted to compare and contrast their system of operating with one closer to home where students Take, you know, they have to keep log books and they write examinations. Theory and practice, in fact, has become quite divided since the 19th century, in fact, in vocational training. And so I wanted to look how that division between the two played out. Also, very importantly, I'll, I'll make this my last point, because a lot of the book is about this, but um, what the young men were learning in, additional, in addition to learning how to use their mallet or shape bricks or whatever on the building sites in Yemen and Mali. They were also learning how to run a business, how to speak to clients, how to behave, how to comport themselves in a socially respectable way. Social comportment was a very big part of my training at the Building Crafts College, but like arts colleges and vocational colleges across the land, there's really very little time for learning the business side of it. So it means that graduates are going off into the world of work with one of the key parts missing from the education. And so it became quite interesting to follow afterwards and a great pleasure because I remain friends with so many of the woodworkers I trained with, but to follow their trajectories into the world of work um, and what challenges they met starting their own businesses and in such a difficult time as we started off in. Anyways, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks for the question. Well, thank you, that, that, that's fascinating. Now, let's take a couple of the written questions first of all. Um, so uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Tim. Professor Ingold has kindly sent in a, 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 a question and I don't know whether you can see it, it, Trevor, but he says, would you agree with me that to level the playing field and admit to the plurality of forms of intelligence, we also have to reject the meritocratic idea that the role in of education in society is to serve an, as an engine of social mobility. <laughs> in essence, that's what he said. <laughs> My answer is <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thanks, Tim, for the question. And I, I should also mention too, Tim, Tim will be known to probably everybody in the audience this afternoon. And of course, um, my many conversations with Tim over the years have been both a great pleasure and source of inspiration. Um, if, if, if I were in a position of decision-making, this may not um, be music to all ears in the audience, but I would probably, first thing, get rid of public schools. 
I mean, we need to create a, we need to create an educational system where everybody is invested in it at all strata in our society to make all schooling good. And good schooling requires both financial investment and emotional investment and intellectual investment. So that needs to be coming from all quarters. And um, I think it's, it's absolutely important that if all students were to, to begin in a classroom where making things and taking them apart was core to the curriculum. In doing so, learning about maths, learning about geometry, learning about chemistry, the chemical properties of the materials they're working with, learning about physics, learning about history, because they're learning about the craft trade and the objects, the histories of the objects they're making. And also thinking about the ethics and the morality of what they're doing brings them into the future. I think we'd have a much more level playing field. So that's my short answer. You don't think education has a role in, in enabling the poor people of the world to make good? Uh, well, absolutely, but it should have a role in, 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 in Morris's terms, letting everybody realize their potential. So not, not one more than another, but uh, a meritocracy in the sense that there's diversity, meaning that individuals can find their stream, find those things that they really excel in. And it might be multiple things. It might be multiple disciplines that speak to one another for that individual. And the meritocracy will be measured against their own values, against their own expectations for themselves, against their own aspirations for the future as individuals and for the world. Hmm. Well, thank you, because that leads us in, 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 in beautifully um, and to, to Kester Bruin's question, where he yeah. says, the body has disappeared from education. The focus has been almost exclusively uh, on the mind. Uh, and the, 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 the question has just, has just uh, vanished, which it happens sometimes in, in, mid, in midstream, but not to worry, here it is. As a teacher of mathematics and having to teach digitally through all this, I can testify to this as being a total disaster for our young people. I'd love to hear how Trevor would advise lobbying government to promote changing this, especially as we bounce back from COVID and the sea change which has already happened. So there we are. What do we tell government to do? Thanks, Kester. Um, Kester and I know one another and I, I, I know what a brilliant maths teacher he is and I know how inspiring he is to his students as well. Um, he's probably exemplary in the way that he brings the body into mathematizing in the classroom. And I think, Kester, that um, it's going to be a combined effort. It's uh, going to be a combined effort between those of us who are working in the university, those of us who are working in the classroom with children and with secondary school students, those of us who have been charged with um, designing curricula for, for schooling. We all need to work collaboratively and we need to get the message to, we need to get the message to government and also to the media. We need to be hearing a whole lot more about the pleasure, satisfaction and fulfillment that can be found in embodied ways of learning and knowing. Um, so, it's kind of a, a slightly ambiguous, uh, perhaps, answer to your question, but it's one that I think um, demands a very profound, um, linked up answer with lots of different experts. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that the, the book that uh, I'm publishing will be part of the engine that will move things forward in the right direction. But certainly the starting point needs to be greater investment in vocational training and hands-on learning in schools across the board and in the workplace. Mm. Thank you. And then we're getting really coherent questions here. So thank you very much, audience. It's, it's great when this happens. So now we have one from Chris Chapman, which is exactly on the same theme. And Chris says, uh, uh, there, there is a large educational and post-educational appetite for embodied activity already, but it's just more focused on sport than craft. Isn't there anything we can learn from the popularization of sport that could be applied to craft learning? And how do you make craft work aspirational? I guess the second one is related, but why don't we take the first bit? It's a very interesting thought. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, and Chris and I have had, well, this is so fun. Um, I'm getting to speak with people that I haven't had a chance to speak with in a little while. Um, Chris and I have had lots of conversation about um, the intelligent body in sport. Chris, Chris is a sportsman himself. And um, he knows that I believe that sport too, physical activity is, it needs to, it had been always very central to, um, to the school curricula. It's for health and safety reasons and cost reasons and selling off playing fields. Unfortunately, it has suffered terribly in the last few decades. And um, sport needs to be brought again, more squarely into the education of muscles, moral and mind of young people. Um, and I think there's a great deal to learn from sport, um, not just that it's a good thing to do or that, wow, that was such an intelligent play on the field. Um, but also by more carefully studying sport, I think like studying craft, um, we have a better chance of understanding the very rapid um, interaction between the whole person, between mind and body split, second decision-making, and also incredibly coordinated interaction with other. I, I mean, it's almost like um, sport is like like jazz and, it, and music, another, another field that needs to be better celebrated and, and integrated into learning. But these are all ways that remove the individual from kind of individual containment and put them into kind of a full field of practice with others. So yes, Chris, I, you, you know that I, I, I agree entirely and, and sport deserves very much its own dedicated studies. Mm. Yes, and and, uh, and and Robert Simpkins follows up the whole question of mind and hand and says, as a field worker, how did the mind and hand connections that you were making within craft work affect the kinds of questions or conversations you had with craftspeople? Mm, hugely. Thanks, Rob, for that question. Um, you know, interestingly, I mean, we could go back to the um, to the 19th century, to some of the early anatomists, um, Charles Bell, for instance, who were studying the, the neural anatomy that connects our fingertips through our hand and our arms to our brain and the close connection. And that was followed on by, um, by evolutionary sciences looking at the way that the hand and the brain not only formed each other, but the hand also played a very crucial role in the development of language and communication, as I'm gesturing. When I came to the Building Crafts College, it really struck me when I started off there, how people talked about, they talked about the tool as an extension of their fingers. The instructors spoke about that. They, they spoke in everyday practice about the kind of writing that you find in neuroanatomy, about the connections between brain, hand and tool, but in a very practical sense. And um, so the brain hand logically extends to tool and um, MRI scanning in the last few decades have, has, also been a, has also enabled us to understand better the really direct links that develop through practice, through long-term practice between brain, hand and tool. The way the, the sense of touch becomes extended to the tip of the tool in use. And so we know that um, we, we know that our tools become in the same way that prosthetics do over time. So um, that, that whole subject matter that was discussed in the first part of my research on a daily basis in the, uh, in the workshop became the focus of my study in a, in a more concerted way um, in the second study that I did in 2012 and 13. Mm. Well, well, thank you. And Joy Henry says, which is very apropos, she says, uh, uh, at Brooks, we had to employ an English carpenter to work with a Japanese one when we built a Japanese room in Oxford, but they couldn't speak any of each other's languages. Nevertheless, they got on really well in comparing the way that they worked and became good friends. Can you explain that to us, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't explain it 
Joy, um, because it's it hasn't been something that I've studied, but I have also witnessed. I remember making a film um, a few years ago, a documentary film. It was it was about the Masons that I worked with in Jene in Mali, and it was a film that I made with the Smithsonian um, in Washington. And we were meant to fly over to Mali to make the film there with the builders on site, these Masons that I had worked with previously for years. And then the, there was a coup d'etat and a Tuareg rebellion and everything came together to be a real mess in Mali. So we managed to get five of the Masons over from Jene to join us in Holland to make the film. And part of that project, we took them to, um, to a building site in Holland where there were kind of traditional artisans who were brick bricklayers um, rebuilding a, uh, an historic structure. The bricklayers could only speak Dutch and the, um, the Jene Masons, they could, speak, they could speak a number of different West African languages, but none that were commensurate with Dutch. And they got on like a house on fire. The conversation, the conversation was through um, exclamations, applause, um, grins, but also by the Jene Masons taking the trowels physically from the Dutch masons and showing them how they would lay a brick and how they would clean up the mortar. And I think that this probably goes on all of the time because spoken language is only a part of our communication apparatus. We communicate more than I think we realize through the body. A big part of my studies has been to try to better understand how the actions that we perform, the gestures we make, the grips that we make on the tools are in fact communicated to others who are watching us and how that visual information is translated into a kind of motor information that allows equivalent movements to be made possible. So I think that in that context, sorry, but I, I think that in that context, spoken language and words become almost like just the punctuation for the more important communication that's going on with the body. Thank you, that's a, that's a, that, that, that's a beautiful answer, thank you. And uh, my, Michael is, is, has sent in a, 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 a text message, uh, Michael Hertzfeld, and uh, thank you for those comments earlier, Michael. Um, he said that in answering your a, a question, you said that social comportment was a large part of what artisan trainees were learning. I agree. But then he says, recording my informants on Crete were trained to be aggressive Cretan men, cunning in stealing with their eyes and other forms of socially approved deceit. Should a young person in a craft in today's dog eat dog, neoliberal world, learn to be socially benign? Or does the business world require something morally more ambiguous? Good question. I mean, wow. Um, I know Michael's work well, obviously. And in fact, the idea of stealing with the eyes, the apprentice not being explained anything, not being offered anything on any platter, had to steal with the eyes, how to behave, how to work. And I witnessed the very same thing, particularly in Yemen. In the Building Crafts College, um, it was a more liberal democracy. In fact, students were expected to ask questions. Um, they, were, they were trained to be Khan, who was our first year woodworking instructor, taught us not only how to use, use tools, but how to behave in a gentlemanly way, in a civil way. Remember my cohort was all men. And, um, and to be trustworthy and dependable. So these sorts of attitudes were being that's what that's what was being instilled in the in the crafts work in the crafts people in my workshop. The truth of the matter is is that probably more like the um, the the craftsmen in Yemen or in Crete, they also to make it need to be able to steal with the eyes. They need to be a little bit more more canny, perhaps be able to work on the sly to be able to make their business work. Um, but. In fact, for many of them, it's just in direct contradiction with the aspirations that they have. As I said early on in my talk, it's about looking for a new order. And I think for a lot of craftspeople, they want to emulate the 
idea of this new order. They don't, they, they've moved away from kind of the dirty way of work, the uh, liberal economics of today's uh, society. They're looking for a different way. So I think they wouldn't be living authentically with themselves if they did so. But I think it's probably individually for them to decide what to do. Craft cooperatives don't work, uh, Trevor. I mean, certainly artists are represented by galleries that take an enormous cut. And so, of course, the gallery owners get accused of being thieves. But it does mean that an artist can just paint. And such thing, such a thing isn't possible in the craft world, you think? They just take too great a proportion of the... It had, there, had been, um, there had been foundations for that, David. Um, in fact, this was represented originally by the liveries by the guilds. So you need to go back in history a little bit to think about the role that the guilds played in the medieval period. They, they represented not only the interests of the craftspeople, but they regulated disputes, they set prices, they ensured that, for instance, in amongst the, uh, the worshipful company of carpenters, part of, this, part of the rules and the statutes were that if you have extra work, you give it to one of your fellow livery. During the 18th century, this started to become undone as the industrial process started to pick up after 1750. <clears throat> and the role and power of the liveries really started to disintegrate. Um, and of course, with that disintegration and the rise of, um, of industrialized labor, as opposed to skilled work, you also had backing that up um, the, uh, the liberal thinking of people like um, of John Locke and John Adams, you, you, had, you, had this, uh, you had this thinking that was propelling kind of an industrialized um, way forward. And in fact, craftspeople really lost their voice and their unity. And what happened in the 19th century, a number of collectives started, these craft unions started. These craft unions, in, fact continued on and they protected the rights of many craftspeople working in variety of fields um, into the 1970s and 80s. Um, during Thatcher's government, the, um, the representative bodies were, uh, they were dismantled because they were associated with unionism. And so a lot of craftspeople lost that representative voice. Even today, the modern apprenticeship scheme for all its merits is also government driven and it's driven by big industry. So it's not about the formation, the overall complete formation of the whole craftsperson. person. It's about creating competencies for a skilled workforce. It's economically driven for the wealth of the nation. Mm. I must, uh, so Adam, Adam, Adam Smith. Smith can, but what about Adam the Smith German example, uh, Trevor? What about Sorry? the German example? Where they, where, they, where they do still have a, 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 an existing apprenticeship system. Does that not work better? Absolutely. I mean, you know, ugh, gosh, since the late 19th century, England and those worried about the plight of craft work, artisanal work, work of the hand, have compared the trajectory that Britain had taken in its kind of laissez-faire attitude to leave the training to the industry. They compared it unfavorably with what was going on in Britain and France and Switzerland, Austria, on the continent in general. Um, and in fact, those very same comparisons continue today. Um, in, the, uh, in, in the 2000s, the Castles Report and the Leach Report on, on skill and handwork also compare the pretty patchy education that we're still offering overall to to artisans and people that, vocational workers, people that work with their hands. I was quite fortunate, in fact, to be in a milieu like the Building Crafts College that still has that sense of tradition, had that sense of responsibility. And as I had read in you know, the words of Jim, recognize that it needed to be forming the whole person. But unfortunately, a lot of craft training just simply isn't like that. Mm. Splendid. Now, now we will try for a live question. We, uh, forgive us, everybody, if it doesn't work completely smoothly, but Douglas Brooks, for uh, several minutes, has offered to be the guinea pig. So I've now pressed allow to talk, and we'll see what happens. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Great. Trevor, uh, my publisher introduced us. I'm the boat builder and I've been- Oh, publishing. yeah. <laughs> I love your work. Oh, thank you. And I wanted to ask you, um, my, I want to ask you about multi-generational craftspeople because one of my teachers in Japan was a fourth generation <laughs> boat builder. Uh, I interviewed a man who claimed to have been an eighth generation boat builder. And yet I work in America as what we, part of what we call a revival of wooden boat building. And there's nothing like that. There is, there's almost no one working in wooden boat building in North America today that can trace you know, back multi-generations. And I, I feel that there is a difference in the craft that I think is created by that deep generational sense of the craft. And given that you worked in Africa, where I assume you encountered the same sort of thing, I just wondered uh, what your thoughts are on that. Thanks so much. Thanks, Douglas, for your, um, for your question and your comment. And just to say, I recently, um, I recently quoted your work in a, uh, a lecture I gave to archaeologists on ancient boat building. But I love, I love your work. Um, yeah, I mean, interestingly, in Yemen, there was kind of, especially for the families, the established um, families of masons that were working in the big cities like Sana'a, the capital where I worked, there was kind of an expectation at this time in the present that by the third or fourth generation, kind of sounding like Ibn Khaldun here, but by that point, the next generation should be moving on into other things, not working with their hands anymore. It was recognized that the work was backbreaking and very difficult. But prior to that, masons in Yemen had been masons for generations. And they also knew the history of their trade. Likewise in West Africa, where I work. Few, if any, of the uh, furniture makers and fine woodworkers that I trained alongside in London had any family legacy in the, in the trade. Um, in fact, uh, only a few, and it was usually the younger men and women who came in, who had a father, an uncle, or a grandfather who had worked in the trade. Lots of those who I trained with had grandfathers, uncles, grandmothers, mothers, or whatever, that dabbled in the woodshed, but they, they weren't necessarily professional makers. And it's, it's interesting, I remember interviewing um, one of the last remaining uh, furniture makers in the Chilterns in High Wycombe. He's one of the last, and that was a major place of chair production in the 19th and early 20th century. And there are very few furniture makers in that. And I was interviewing him and he was saying, yeah, he said, that's all gone. That whole, that generational kind of establishment in, in the chair making trade. He said, but he said, a lot of the younger people coming in now, he said, most of them have done something else in life. They're coming in and he said, they're doing they're doing really interesting, innovative kind of stuff. They're usually self-trained. He said, so they can't do the fancy stuff like cabrio legs and, and marquetry and inlay, or they're not very good at French polishing, but they're, they're coming up with innovative designs and um, they're doing interesting work in that way. Perhaps in the US, in the UK and other post-industrial nations, Perhaps we'll be starting kind of the, a, a new kind of multi-generational um, history in the, in the trades. Maybe the next generation of children who have parents in the trades will say, my parents made a living from it. They had a good life. They were always kind of thinking and challenging themselves and inspired. I've been inspired by them and I'm going to continue. Perhaps that will happen. But I agree with you that without that generational history, you know, sorry, one last thing. One of, the, one of the furniture makers that I interviewed said, uh, hold on. You, you can have, wait, innovation without tradition is terrible. And I think he's, Absolutely right. Innovation in order to 
be able to speak the language, to have a vocabulary, to even understand the physics of, you know, a chair that needs to be sat in, needs to have that history, it needs to have that tradition in it. Thank you for the question. It's fascinating to think about. Well, thank you too. And now we have another live one. If if Jill Sudbury is still with us, uh, please. Yes, I am. Uh, splendid. Hello, Jill. Hello, Trevor. Thank you so much for this fabulous talk. And thank you so much for also including Jen in this. Um, you may remember when you taught me that I come from a family of architects and um, in our household, um, any question that we asked, um, if it could be explained by drawing, it was drawn. And I was very struck when you were showing photographs from the building college about how you were showing um, you know, the, the, the instructors with the students and often with tools and so forth. Um, and I remember you, you used to tell us about the, uh, the minaret builders in, in Sana and how they conceptualized um, stone and so forth without, the, uh, without any uh, obvious literacy or numeracy. Um, what I'd really like to inquire is how, how the other means of communication that may be um, other nonverbal means of commu communication are used in this process, because it is very, very embodying. Um, yes. Thank you. And, and gosh, it's been, it's been such a long time since we've last been in contact, so it's really nice to hear your voice. Um, <clears throat> drawing was a, a fundamental part of the education at the Building Crafts College. So there were multiple things that were used in what was what, Khan, our instructor, called them um, uh, uh, toolbox discussions. And he would usually kind of colonize um, somebody's workbench and lay out the tools for his lesson and usually some books and illustrations, some handouts, um, often a pencil and paper. And his, our introduction to a new tool and how to use it or how to make a new joint or how to go about producing um, a scale drawing or a full scale rod drawing for the things we were making. He would do it, he would carry it out in practice. So not only did we have his demonstration accompanied by his verbal explanation and often kind of illustrate it with pictures from something or with a little bit of text. He'd say, oh, take a look at page 93 in such and such a book. But really it came from what it was that he was doing and even in the drawing. So when he was, when he was showing um, students how to use the, uh, the T square and to use their compass and for us how to use the different, our different leads and create different weights on the paper, it was an embodied practice. So his demonstration of doing the drawing was important, but his drawing also later stood there as an artifact to which we could go back to during our own processes to see if what we were doing measured up with what he had produced. So the drawing was absolutely essential. And it was so critical to the way that we all in the workshop learned to think. Quite different from um, when I had been an architect. As an architect, I had been trained to, to plan, to draw, to design on paper at scale. But the woodworking created a more fluid, dynamic dialogue between the process of drawing and making. We were constantly going, as we would, we would produce a scale drawing, turn it into a rod drawing, then measure our pieces of timber off of that and the cuts for our joints. And then in putting, up, putting it together, usually in kind of a mock-up model, we'd realize, hmm, this doesn't work, or the proportions aren't really right, or this is not going to be comfortable to sit in, or I'm not going to be comfortable sitting at this table. We'd go back to the drawing. And it was this constant going back and forth. And of course the drawing too, it's where the process of the design usually began. It's where the kind of the inspiration or those kind of fuzzy thoughts first made their way into the world was in the drawing. So um, drawing, drawing is a making and it was absolutely part of the tool making as well and absolutely integral to our thinking. So thank you. I hope I answered that. You did, thank you. Trevor, we, 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 we're moving to the last part of the talk and I was wondering if your talk, I was wondering if we could go back to the university curriculum and anthropology and your wonderful ideas. So how would 
if, if we sat down with colleagues and we said, you often redesign your courses, it's not unusual. Please redesign them in such a way that's in conformity with the ideas that you've been developing. An obvious one is just, I myself, when I want to explain something, I use a drawing. I don't use PowerPoint um, because that's the way I think. But, but much, much more basically than that, uh, can you offer us a, a course? Thanks, David. Yeah. Um, I think both Tim and I do this in our coursework, and I would imagine others do as well. Um, for Tim Ingold, um, the integration of art, architecture, archaeology, and anthropology is you know, very tight, and he likes students to think through all of those disciplines in theorizing and writing about things. And in the course that I taught for many, many years at SOAS, in fact, I think I started it in 2000 and ran it right through till I left SOAS in 2015, um, was the anthropology of space, place, and architecture. And the core component of that course, it was not exam-based. It was, in fact, it was very heavily inspired by my fieldwork experiences. It was project-based. And I was encouraging the students to think beyond words, to think beyond writing, and to find a place in the city of London, a place that they frequented daily or walked through on a regular basis, to take that as their field site and explore it in a phenomenological way, um, to explore it through their senses. And the project that they produced had a written component, but they were encouraged to make an installation piece, a sculpture or a carving, to knit something, to create a film that evoked a sense, a really kind of important, tangible characteristic of the place that had been their field site. And um, the other thing I did in the course is I begged my students that one day a week when they're doing their field work, leave their telephone at home, be in the present, be in place, in the place that they are studying and that they are studying with. And so I think there are lots of creative ways to, um, to do it in the, uh, in the university. I can easily imagine how it could be rolled out, and it already is to a great extent, in engineering and architecture and in the sciences. But there's no reason that it can't be in history and anthropology and political science, um, a more hands-on approach to understanding the subject matter that we're supposed to be mastering. Mm. Thank you. That, that, that's extremely helpful, helpful for, for, for our, our, our um, considerations. Thank you. And, and Bo Wang would like to ask a question as well here um, related. He says, uh, there is a growing field of user experience, research minded design, like in tools and medical devices where craft improvements um, meet anthropological research. Do you see anything similar in woodwork in your research? In other words, will there be jobs in woodwork for anthropologists with research skills? Well, um, I think it, I, mean, I, I kind of made the, the, the last 15 years of my professional life as an anthropologist centered on woodworking. It just, it's a treasure trove. Crafts offer a treasure trove for discovery and exploration and understanding what makes us human, how we, how we how we learn how we know how we change also over time so i think that i mean there already are a lot of anthropologists who are taking you know in the last last couple of decades who are taking up the tools of the trades that they're studying um who are also thinking more creatively in the way that they record things not just in words but in drawing things in mapping things in visuals um and thinking about the the the, the smellscapes and the soundscapes. Um, so that is going on. I think that what anthropology can really bring to it, what I think generally could be learned from, from craft work, and speaking specifically to the brain hand tool connection, is the design of perhaps more, more efficient prosthetics. How is it that we actually create extensions of our body that really work well with us? And this cannot be done successfully by technology alone. It needs to have the, the social, the cultural, the individual, the personal dimension to that. And I think in that sense, 
anthropologists would have a really big role to play in developing that kind of understanding, knowledge, and technology. Mm -hmm. Wang, I hope that answered your question somewhat. And also, there are two questions here about the present situation. One from Margaret Margaret Putz, and uh, the question is really to do with with woodwork at the moment. Has the COVID uh, lockdown seen an increased uh, desire to do more woodwork uh, or more anything else to do with crafts? DIY is, if there's anything having a renaissance right now, it's probably DIY. Probably more so even between the, the months of March and September when people could do things outside. But, um, you know, for instance, the modern apprenticeships, this, this will kind of answer, answer it squarely, I suppose, in a way. The modern apprenticeships, the Leach Report really urged the government to invest more in promoting the profile of the apprenticeships and um, developing better curricula, making them more a more attractive option, developing a level playing field for young men and women to choose between. And the report was urging that we should be reaching at least 500,000 new entrants per year by 2010. In fact, there were impressive numbers. So it means that a lot of people were in fact coming into artisanal work, craft work and the vocational trades, including woodworking. Um, during the, uh, up until 2010 and onward. And then in about 2017, a lot of the financing was unplugged and a new levy, um, a new a levy uh, funding system was introduced um, to the apprenticeships, which made them less attractive for small and medium sized uh, employers to take on apprentices. And um, the numbers have plummeted. So in fact, we reached the 500,000 mark and now we're in uh, 2019, 2020, the number of apprentices had dropped to a quarter of that number. Now a place like the Building Crafts College is still attracting on its flagship courses like the Fine Woodwork Program, it's still attracting a steady stream of, um, of, of trainees. I expect that this time of COVID will have given people ample, perhaps too much, opportunity to reflect on what it is they really want to do. And it is my hope, but the proof will be in the numbers that actually sign on. But I would imagine there will be this huge surge in the number of young people and not so young people um, looking to go into the, uh, into the trades. Well, thank you for an absolutely fascinating evening, evening Trevor. It is, it's absolutely marvellous. I'm so sorry to all those colleagues and friends who haven't had their questions answered. We really do promise to let the speaker go after two hours. And uh, But look, um, we will forward all your questions to him afterwards. And if he has some time during this lockdown, he might be able to answer answer answer, answer some of them. And and, and thank you also to... to um, uh, our other two speakers, uh, Jen Law and, uh, and Michael Hetzfeld. It's a great pleasure to, to meet you and to see you again. And, uh, and thank you, of course, to Emir and Hanin. Are you, are you here, Emir and Hanin? And if you would like to say goodbye, then I think we're done for this evening. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who stayed on. <laughs>